All right, today we're going to go through a helical pile design problem. It's going to be a pretty simplistic design model and steps, but it's going to give you the concepts you need to understand what Helicap is doing behind the scenes. Uh, Helicap will basically automate a lot of this in terms of creating different types of pile configurations and automating the uh, bearing capacity calculations with depth so you don't have to necessarily do them by hand. Uh, it's always good to check uh, Helicap to make sure that you agree with what it's outputting, but uh, this is going to be the uh, design example from the Chance Technical Design Manual that goes through uh, a helical pile design. So we're going to design a helical foundation on a typical clay profile. The profile consists of 10 feet of high plasticity clay underlain by 20 feet of low, low plasticity or silty clay. Um, we're going to have a cohesion of 2000 PSF for the high plasticity clay with a density of 105 pounds per cubic foot. And then for the uh, silty clay, we're going to have a blow count of 20 blows per foot. So uh, the boring was terminated at 30 feet, didn't encounter any water table, and we don't have any other soils information beyond or within this. So loads on the exterior strip foundations are approximately three kips per linear foot design load. Uh, we're going to presume this is a compression load only for this example. Um, and we're only going to go through the design for an exterior strip foundation because that should give you everything you need to translate over to a uh, spread footing column design. Um, so uh, also per the structural engineer of record, the exterior strip foundations can withstand a maximum pile spacing on center of eight foot. And this is a, a typical rule of thumb. Uh, eight foot maximum spans on a strip foundation is pretty typical. Uh, you can always go to your structural engineer of record uh, and, and ask, can we go wider? Or also ask, do we need to be uh, closer on our spacings? And so if you go wider, you're going to have more load per column per helical pile. And if you go closer together, you're going to have less load per helical pile. And that's an important thing to understand uh, ahead of designing your helical piles. So we're going to uh, put our helical pile probably through this high plasticity clay layer because we don't want to have any issues with uh, shrink or swell activity within this upper layer. So we're going to presume that we're going to penetrate our helical pile fully through into this low plasticity clay. So we've got 10 feet thickness of this high plasticity clay layer and we're going some amount into this low plasticity clay layer. Okay, so first question, you know, what is the load required per pile? And so the load per pile is going to be our line load times our on center spacing. So we have three kips per linear foot times eight feet spacings equals 24 kips design load compression. And so if we had gone through our calculations and found that this 24 kips design load compression, we can't ever find capacity we might need to tighten that spacing up a little bit and reduce the uh, load per pile. But for now, we're gonna go with this 24 kips design load compression per pile. <clears throat> so then you select a trial helical pile. Uh, we're gonna try a helical pile with a 10 inch flight and a 12 inch flight on the same pile. So we start with our ultimate bearing capacity uh, is the CNC plus the overburden term plus the uh, footing width term and if we take these these are going to be in pressures and we multiply these terms by the flight area at each flight we can calculate the bearing capacity at each individual flight and so it's important for this specific uh, example we're penetrating fully into this layer intentionally so um, this area of the helices multiplied by this single bearing capacity equation is okay because we can uh, be in the same material, we can distribute it. So uh, also since we're only in clays, we can cancel out some of these terms. So this overburden term, this N sub Q goes to zero for a phi angle of zero for clay. Uh, and then also since the B term, the B uh, footing width within this term is very small, 10 inches and 12 inches. Uh, we can also cancel that third term. So if we take this equation, put it up here, we can actually reduce it into uh, this area of helices times our just cohesion term uh, for the bearing capacity. And so 
Uh, like I said, since we're intending to bear all of these flights in one consistent layer, that means we can just add these areas together and use the same bearing capacity for these. <clears throat> There's no depth, you know, part of this term either, so the difference in these uh, two, two plates won't matter. Um, if we're using a sand or a frictional material, we might have to take that into account a little bit with the uh, increase in the overburden stress with depth. So since we're um, doing that, we can pull from the Chance Technical Design Manual, or you can pull it from a product catalog, uh, the area of these flights individually. And so for the 10-inch uh, flight, it has an area of 0.531 foot squared. And for the 12 inch flight, it has an area of 0.771 foot squared. So you can look that up in the Chance Technical Design Manual. <clears throat> so then we have our uh, cohesion is equal to the 20 blows per foot. If you divide that by eight, uh, I did that uh, wrong. That's actually 2.5 KSF, but I automatically uh, went up to PSF uh, because that's what I usually do. So this is 2.5 KSF, which is 2,500 PSF. Just make sure that you keep your uh, units in check when you're doing these calculations. And then we have our bearing capacity factor for clays. Uh, we can use nine for this since we've got a deep foundation. Um, it's skimped in, uh, I don't remember the year, but it's a skimped in bearing capacity term. Can go up to nine uh, for clays, saturated clays at a sufficient depth to, to uh, footing width ratio. So uh, then we have our calculation for the bearing capacity load, ultimate uh, capacity load. So we have that area of the helices times our cohesion times our bearing capacity factor. Uh, you can see 0.531 for our area of our 10 inch plate, 0.771 for the area of our 12 inch plate. Uh, we sum these together and multiply that quantity by 2500 PSF for our uh, cohesion. And then we have our bearing capacity factor of nine right here. So then that calculates out to 29,295 pounds of load capacity. And so that's an ultimate capacity. And so if we were to compare our ultimate capacity to our design load of 24,000 pounds, uh, that's definitely not enough ultimate capacity to have a factor of safety of two against our design load. So that's not okay. So. We're going to select a new lead section, a new trial lead section with more flight area because we have to distribute that uh, load out into a lighter pressure so that we don't fail, fail these clays in bearing capacity. So we're going to try a 10, 12, 14 lead section. And so we the same thing as before. We pull those areas of each individual plate. Since we're going to take this uh, lead section still through this upper high plasticity clay layer, we're gonna have that same condition where we can use the same uh, bearing capacity uh, for each flight, and we can add those together. So uh, 0.531 foot squared for our 10 inch, 0.771 foot squared for our 12 inch, and 1.049 foot squared for our 14 inch. Plug that into the same equation, add those three up, multiply by our cohesion, and multiply by our bearing capacity factor, and that results in a load ultimate capacity of 52,930 pounds. Okay. So then we got to compare that to our design load. Uh, so our factor safety 52,930 over 24,000 is a factor safety of 2.2. So this lead section, since it's more than two, is sufficient to distribute that load into a small enough pressure to where we have enough bearing capacity. So now, uh, now that we know what lead section we can use, we can determine what torque is going to be required to achieve that capacity. And so we don't need to go to a factor safety of 2.2. That's overkill per, you know, how, how standard of care requires us to design these helicals. So we can stop at a factor safety of 2. And so um, since these are performance-based uh, specifications, we can call it out as this required torque equals the ultimate capacity divided by our shaft specific torque correlation factor. So that K sub T is a tor torque correlation factor that is specific to the type of pile uh, that we're wanting to install. So we're going to exchange that for our design load times 2.0 for our factor of safety. It gives us an ultimate 
resistance that we want to get to divided by our shaft specific torque correlation factor. So what shaft should we use? Uh, we don't have anything in here that indicates that it's a soft material. We don't have any lateral loads. We don't have any moments or anything that would, you know, require an increase in flexural resistance or uh, unbrace length in this layer. So we can probably select a square shaft pile, but we need to select one that has enough torque related capacity as well as axial capacity to transmit the loads uh, all the way down to these flights. So uh, if you look at your design manual, the um, one of the lower uh, capacity, most of, more efficient shafts that we can do for square shaft is SS5. So SS5 has a torque rating of 5,700 foot pounds and an ultimate resistance, uh, axial resistance and compression of 57 kips. So this seems like it's uh, pretty well uh, suited for the loads and torques that we're kind of calculating. So uh, all of our square shaft options have a torque correlation factor, K sub T, of 10 foot to the minus one. So whether I'm using, you know, inch and a half, inch and three quarter, two inch bar for square shaft, it's all going to be 10. So I can just use that 10 in this equation up here to calculate my required torque for an SS5 is 24,000 times two to get our ultimate load, divided by this 10 correlation factor, gives me a required torque for a three foot, approximately a three foot continuous uh, torque of 4,800 foot pounds. So this is what the specialty contractor is gonna have to see before he terminates his installation, 4,800 foot pounds. So 4,800 foot pounds required is less than the 5,700 foot pounds that is the rating for SS5. So we had it up here, 5,700 foot pounds is the rating of SS5. So we're good there. And then you have to make sure, do I have enough axial resistance or tension resistance if it were part of this project, but it's not. So 48 kips uh, compression load, and this is ultimate at this point, is less than the 57 kips compression rating of the SS5. So that's also okay. And so it's, it gets a little confusing sometimes. You just gotta make sure that you're keeping in mind, you know, ultimates and design capacities and loads and stuff like that. So just uh, always remember that your ultimate resistance needs to be twice your design load for using a torque correlation uh, methodology of assessing your helical piles. So there's also some specific things um, to this design example that I wanted to call out. Um, need to call out some specifics for minimum penetration. So those fat clays, if you were to bear within them at a shallower depth, um, you might have some issues with activity, you know, shrink and swell. And, and that would still cause movement similarly to if you had a shallow foundation up here, you know, cause some movement within your structure. So you, you'd want to penetrate through to where the material that you're uh, relying on for your capacity, for your movement uh, of your helical pile when you stress it, uh, is not going to be in that active zone. Um, it's also, you know, a specific point that I want to make for this. Um, if this does swell or if this does shrink, uh, the square shaft specifically has a very low contact area with this soil, and there is a little bit of an annulus that can be created. Um, it should backfill itself over time, but it's not going to be, you know, this super um, intense grab onto this shaft. So if you have shrink swell, it usually uh, doesn't have too much of an impact on, you, you know, like down drag loads or uplift loads when it's uh, lifting. So shouldn't be a concern for this, but it might be something that you'd want to assess if you're using a larger diameter round shaft. Like if you had a four and a half inch round shaft pile, that might be something you'd want to uh, consider in terms of additional load or additional uplift. So, uh, so it might be necessary to call out a minimum penetration depth for this one, regardless of torque. Um, so if they are, you know, advancing the helical pile through this zone and you hit torque right here uh, with your pile and most of your flights are in the upper fat clay layer, you might have to, you know, advance your pile through it, even though you're hitting torque until you get to some, um, not necessarily known, but expected depth where the high plasticity clay 
stops. So if you have multiple borings and you want, you know, to use an average or uh, even maybe a maximum, if there was another boring that had 15 feet of fat clay, you might use that as your um, minimum depth of penetration, including your lead section. But you just got to use engineering judgment to make sure that you, you get the helical piles through that layer, uh, however deep you think that needs to be. Uh, typical lead section for a three-flighted uh, helical pile is seven feet. So for this case, with this single boring, uh, with our 10-foot layer of high plasticity clay, uh, it might be a good idea to call it a minimum penetration depth of 17 feet because per our model that would get us through the upper depth, uh, upper depths of that high plasticity clay and get us all the way through. And like I said, this is 10 feet of it for the upper profile and then seven more feet to get through this layer based on the boring.